One week after the horrifying mass shooting in Aurora, Colorado, we have seen a few calls for new restrictions on guns. And a handful of Democrats in the House are calling for a ban on outsized magazines, more bullet control than gun control. Half a dozen Democrats in the Senate are pushing a similar measure for bullet control. At a speech in New Orleans, President Obama mentioned gun control, and just mentioning it counted as a landmark moment. Hunting and shooting are part of a, a, a cherished national heritage. But I also believe that a lot of gun owners would agree that AK-47s belong in the hands of soldiers, not in the hands of criminals. Even if we can all agree on that idea in the abstract, when it comes to policy, we can expect no new restrictions on guns or bullets anytime soon. But hey, here's a response to the massacre in Aurora. A real world could happen actual policy put forward by a Democrat in the liberal Valhalla, otherwise known as the city of San Francisco. San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee had already been calling for police to start a stop and frisk program. This week, he decided he really, really wanted it now more than ever. Mayor Lee telling reporters, quote, I am as, if not more committed, and especially in light of the massacre that occurred in Aurora. If you're not familiar with stop and frisk, there's a good chance it's because you've never been stopped and frisked. It's a policing technique in which officers pull up to whomever they choose and demand answers about why you're standing there and what's in your pockets and so on. One minute you're minding your own business and the next the police have you up against the wall. In theory, police are looking for drugs and guns. In practice, stop and frisk is confrontational almost by nature. And because it depends on police officers deciding which people to confront, the burden of being stopped and frisked tends to fall heavily on African-American and Latino men. For them, being called to account by armed police officers is an ordinary part of going to school, or the store, or the park, or their apartments. The numbers on this are astounding. In New York City, in the first three months of the year, police stopped 200,000 people. Just over half were black. A third were Latino, only 9% were white. This, this is what racial profiling looks like. And with so many men of color having been searched, New York City is now the subject of a federal class action suit. A judge in the case said police should never stop people without reasonable suspicion. She cited the city's, quote, deeply troubling apathy towards New Yorkers' most fundamental constitutional rights. Last month, the city of Philadelphia reached a settlement over its stop and frisk practices with fines and a new court-appointed monitor. That settlement could provide a model for an eventual ruling about New York. Meanwhile, the stopping and frisking keeps on. The rapper Jaziri X and comedian Elon James White just wrote the 10 Frisk Commandments, advice to live by in the current era of stop and frisk. Don't carry a gun, they say. Don't try to run. And then there's this part. Number 10, a strong word called the Constitution. Or does it apply then to only white men as being black and brown? Probable cause, hell no. So why we getting stopped, rain, sleet, hell, snow? Right. San Francisco's Mayor Lee first proposed bringing stop and frisk to his city last month. Since then, protesters have turned out at City Hall, calling out San Francisco's first Chinese-American mayor for pushing a policy that falls along racial lines. The city's Board of Supervisors then passed a unanimous resolution against a New York-style program of stop and frisk. But that is exactly what San Francisco's mayor says he wants. And he wants it even more after the mass shooting in Aurora, saying he is, if anything, more committed. And not just after the massacre in Aurora, but, quote, also the review of what's happening in New York and Philadelphia, even though those reviews have not gone so well. Why is it that progressives will tiptoe only timidly in the direction of gun control, but they're willing to throw black and Latino men against the wall? This is not just any city we're talking about. This is San Francisco, for Pete's sake. There's hardly a more blue locality on the planet. San Francisco is so liberal, you can't get a plastic bag at the grocery store. They spent a long time last year trying to decide under what conditions you can eat butt naked in a restaurant. Sit on your napkin. That, that's now the rule. And yet the mayor of this same super blue paper, not plastic, dining all fresco, 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 ultra liberal San Francisco is ready to start with the stop and the frisk? If San Francisco will not stand up against stop and frisk, who will?
Joining us now is Marquez Claxton, director of the Black Law Enforcement Alliance. He's also a former detective with the NYPD. Mark, it is really good to have you with us tonight. Thanks for having me on, Melissa. So, Mark, I'm, I'm interested because it feels to me like there is there's a real challenge here when you live particularly in communities of color. Many of the communities in which we live are deeply impacted by violence on the streets. We would like violence Absolutely. to stop. On the other hand, we are citizens. We are, you know, people living in these communities. We don't want to have our civil rights violated. How do we make a balance on that issue? Well, first off, let me just add an extra uh, piece of data to the information that you supplied earlier in regards to the NYPD stops. In, in all of the numbers that you gave, 90% of the individuals who were stopped were innocent, had committed mm -hmm. no crime, no violation of law, et cetera. What we have to really understand and be committed to is protecting and defending those rights that people have lived and died for and that are ingrained in the Constitution and supported by Supreme Court decisions such as the Terry versus Ohio decision, which deals specifically with the police officer's ability and, and obligation to stop certain individuals who are suspected of criminal conduct and based on reasonable suspicion. We can't allow police department and police agencies across this nation to dance away from that responsibility. Reasonable suspicion is easy for a professional police officer and a professional police department. Right. I think this is such a, such a critically important point that 90 percent of those who were stopped were actually innocent of whatever it was they were stopped for doing. And, and yet you're unbelievable. Point, yeah. I mean, that, that that is. And the idea that then another locality, particularly one as liberal as San Francisco, would say, oh, this looks like like an appropriate policy. Yeah, well, I can assure you that that uh, Mayor Lee probably spoke to Mayor Bloomberg in New York and they had their one-on-one -on -one conversation without a real comprehensive analytical approach to this. And it's, it's especially troubling given Mayor Lee's uh, a past and civil rights involvement. He, here we have a, a civil rights attorney who is actually considering a policy that has been established, proven, shown by NYPD's own documents and, and data uh, to be race-based and motivated and is not effective. I will argue with anyone about whether or not stop and frisk has any relationship in getting guns off the street. It does not. It pads the numbers for police departments. Police officers already have the ability to stop individuals who are suspected of criminal conduct or have engaged in criminal conduct if, as long as it's based on reasonable suspicion. Professional police officers have been doing that for eons. There is no need to circumvent or short or shortchange a professional police officer's responsibilities. It is a, a, a mistake for any municipality to even consider this type of operation, if you will, stop and frisk. We have the authority as police officers to stop criminals as it is, and we need to implement new strategy and come up with new ideas, perhaps. So, Mark, talk to me about those new ideas, because I've heard you say a couple of times here, professional police officers, which, which sounds to me like there's an aspect of policing that you think we are, we're actually missing when we encourage police officers to do this kind of stop and frisk policy. Right. You know, for, for years, uh, there has been a struggle by many uh, police departments and police agencies across the nation to professionalize their police department, to implement additional training, to have uh, knowledge-based programming and training and functions, et cetera, those things that make your department professional. Listen, anyone can go out and say, go stop 20 people on a corner, and hopefully we'll come up with something. It's really a matter of, of fishing. You know, when you just throw the, the wide net out and, and pull it in and hopefully some, you know, of the, the fish you want to keep will be in it. It takes a professional police officer with the ability and the training and the knowledge and understanding the Constitution and those things that restrict, the, uh, you know, those things that we can do as professional police officers. It takes a professional to really apply the law effectively and still be effective in fighting crime. We can't allow police agencies and police departments, regardless of their intentions, I'm sure that, that Mayor Lee is as concerned as many uh, areas of the country are concerned about the level, escalating level of violence, but you can't infringe upon people's constitutional rights and the stop and frisk program, whatever ridiculous thing that is, does exactly that. Marcus Claxton, I always uh, appreciate your perspective, particularly given um, all of your years um, on the force. Marcus Claxton, the director of Black Law Enforcement Alliance and also a former detective with the NYPD. I appreciate you joining me tonight. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks.